With this week's lesson, we're going to delve back into the art that was created by the earliest humans. But before we do that, let's ask a very simple question. Why study this in the first place? Why is it important? Well, my first experience with an art history class was pretty sleepy. The class was three hours long, and it was held in an un-air-conditioned room in Florida, of all places. I remember that a professor appeared to me to be ancient, and each class was exactly the same. He would turn off the lights, and he would go through slide after slide, his voice a steady monotone. The whoosh of the fans in the warm room would lull me right to sleep. And I thought that art history was the most boring subject ever invented. Well, since that time, thanks to some excellent teachers, I have come to love the study of what we'll call the aesthetic impulse of humans through time. That would be the impulse of humans to create something beautiful or unique by their own hand. As we study the remnants left behind by various cultures, we can use our mind's eye to imagine what may have motivated people to go to great lengths to make beautiful objects of art, even in prehistoric times, before they had a system of writing to record their history. People create art for many reasons. They make art to express religious ideas or strong feelings. Of course, people make art to make money or express power or to use in barter. They also make art to beautify practical tools that they use every day, plus many more reasons than we can list here. While there are common threads that run throughout history in relation to the making of art, there's also great differences in various cultures as to how artists are treated, what the function of art is, and what motivates people to make images or objects of beauty. And often, as we look at these questions, we're left with more questions than we find answers. In studying ancient cultures, it's helpful to remember that we are studying human beings, much like ourselves, with the same basic urges, the desire to find food, to raise families, and to have some kind of religious expression. As we connect with the humanity of the ancient people we study, we're in a sense really just studying ourselves as our ancestors evolved through time. How and when modern humans evolved is the subject of ongoing debate, but really anthropologists now agree that Homo sapiens appeared as early as 120,000 years ago. Scholars generally divide the Stone Age into two main periods, Paleolithic and Neolithic. Now, these are pretty easy to remember because Paleo means old, and this refers to the earliest humans. The art of the Paleolithic period begins with tool making, and the first images appear about 38,000 BC. Now, Neolithic, Neo, means new, so that's the more recent time period. And this refers to the time when human beings began to shift from hunting and gathering and started to farm and settle into villages. Now this led to the development of artists workshops and more permanent architecture. There had to be a mill for the grain for the bread and then there had to be a bread maker and on and on it went. What are we talking about when we talk about the prehistoric world? Well for what we're going to be mostly studying at this point, we'll be looking at Europe. We'll talk about the cave of uh, Altamira, which is here, the cave of Lascaux in France, which is here. Uh, we'll look at a figure that was found here, the woman of Willendorf. While these were all over Europe, the one we'll be looking at was here. And then one more. When we look at Katalhaik in Turkey, that would be right in this place. Now we're looking at Europe and the Near East but the oldest known humans were actually from Africa and they had beautiful uh, cave painting and prehistoric images as well. The term prehistory actually means before written history, before written language in any culture because many illiterate people actually developed complex societies Prehistoric does not mean primitive. 
The Native Americans remained a prehistoric society until well into the 16th century when the European settlers brought a written language, and yet these uh, Native American societies had very sophisticated cultures and traditions. As I said in the previous slide, Paleolithic period begins about 40,000 BC and lasts until somewhere around 8,000 BC. In this period we have the first sculptures, we have the mammoth bone houses which are upcoming in the slideshow, and we have cave painting. It's easy to remember Paleolithic because Paleo means old. Neolithic, Neo means new. And this is from about 8000 BC till about 2300 BC. At this point the Ice Age ends and with the warming uh, climate farming begins and people had less need to keep on the move in order to find the in order to hunt and gather. They settled into villages and they began to raise livestock. This dramatically changed society. Now whether the art made by the early people was made for the same creative reasons that inspire artists today you know, we'll, we will really never know. These early works could have been made simply for practical reasons, or maybe they had, they had deep spiritual significance. But whatever the reason that these early artists work, they remain strong works of art in their own light, often with beautiful design and uh, compositional features. Look at the horses to the right. These, we believe, were painted one on top of another, probably at different time periods. But notice how the artists have really captured the characteristic of a horse. The earliest signs of human beings creating images goes back at least 35,000 years. These earliest images that have sur survived are painted deep in caves. The early artists created beautiful artwork, and it probably served a ceremonial purpose, though any theories about the motivation behind these great works really remains an educated guess. Two of the primary caves in Europe are Altamira, which is located in Spain, and Lascaux, which is located in France. Both of these caves were found by children. Lascaux was discovered in 1940 when three boys followed their dog into a hidden opening in the rock and then they sh shone their lamps and saw these beautiful images. Their parents didn't believe them and so they came back the next day and as they say, history was made. You know, one of the interesting things about Lascaux is that it has been um, it was open for a while after it was discovered in the 1940s and 50s. But this artwork that had been in the caves for tens of thousands of years began to be deteriorated almost immediately by human beings and the funguses and dust that we brought into the cave. So now this cave remains locked up tight and the French government has built a replica. So you can go view Lascaux, but you will be in the fake Lascaux where the original cave is, um, remains safe and protected from deterioration due to humans. Speaking of humans, how did they live in the Paleolithic era? Well, the house below left uh, shows a mammoth house, as does this uh, kind of a diagram at the bottom of the page. The artist rendering that's directly to the left shows one person's idea of how the cave paintings might have been created. I find this amazing as these early artists risked their lives to go deep into caves with only small lamps fueled with animal fat with wicks made of moss. They built elaborate scaffolding that they would actually place into the walls of the caves in order to paint high on the walls and then they left their masterpieces behind to sit in the dark for tens of thousands of years. Why? Cave painting is so mysterious. They lived for days on these scaffolding and um, often they would put their paintings one on top of another. Notice the rhino on the right and notice the movement in the horn at the top. That's a pretty sophisticated way of rendering movement in an animal. 
and if you look at the horses above, you see maybe one horse was painted on top of another. Is this one generation to the next? Is it one artist one day to the next? We really don't know, but it seems to show the life of a horse. While the artists of Lascaux painted realistic animals, the humans that they painted were quite primitive. Look closely at this image to the left. You see how the buffalo is clear, but the guy laying down is just simple lines. One belief is that the early artists felt like these images would capture their power. Maybe they were trying to capture the power of the animals that they were then going to hunt. Or maybe this image on the left is telling the story of a hunter who was slain, someone who died on a hunt. So the image below is from Africa, and it is a rare image of more realistic renderings of people. If we look at this African image below, it's really quite a lovely abstraction of two human beings interacting. Now let's look at some more of this prehistoric cave, these images from Africa. So all of these are from Africa and they're unique in that they depict human beings. The one in the bottom is quite extraordinary because it's actually showing people riding horses. And what we know is that the African subcontinent engaged in quite a lot of trade and travel. This is not like what we see in Europe. It's quite unique. Again, let's go back to imagine the experience of these early artists. They're only light from these primitive lamps, much like the two on the left. If you look at these two lamps, the one above was more typical, and the one below that's more carved out, that probably would have been a special, extraordinary lamp. To apply the pigment to the walls, they used blowpipes, or they would take chunks of charcoal or pigment, such as ochre, and ochre is a kind of an earth. Their brushes were made of chewed sticks, or perhaps their hands. They left behind many handprints, often one on top of another, where each generation would le leave their mark on top of the previous generation. So what we see on the right here is a variety of pigments of natural colors that were found all around the cave at Lascaux. So what about sculpture? Early people created functional art as well as these images on the cave, on the walls of caves. This sculpture on the far right is called the Woman of Willendorf. She's known as an early fertility goddess. One interesting fact about this kind of odd abstract carving is that there was hundreds of these found throughout Europe and they all look pretty much like this. Is small, two or three inches high, and that would have meant that an early um, hunter-gatherer person could put this in a pouch, could carry it with them, and perhaps it was a symbol of good luck. The fact that she's so large and she has large breasts really um, kind of fuels the idea that she was a fertility symbol, but as with all of it, we're only guessing. Now if you look on the right, that's a bone flute carved from probably a bird's bone, but I'm not sure. I find it really amazing that humans had the capacity to figure out how to carve a flute and that they were making music since earliest times. Now if you look to the far right corner, these are duck decoys. I wonder if any of you have used duck decoys in our current era. These were made, these are actually replicas of those made by Native Americans in Nevada over 2,000 years ago. Now this carving at the bottom is kind of interesting. Uh, it's called The Woman from Brasimpoe, and it's 30,000 years old. As we look at this, let's start first by looking at the one with the red background on the right. This is the actual carving. Think about that this small ivory carving was made with primitive tools 30,000 years ago. It leads us to really let our imaginations go. As we can see on the left, an artist has made a rendering of the headdress that might have been depicted here. One thing I find interesting about this artist's rendering is that this is only one person's idea of what an early uh, woman might look like. And really, we don't know. 
it really uh, that's a good way to check out one's own cultural conditioning, isn't it? Ah, let's talk about Stonehenge. Stonehenge is uh, one of the more well-known places that we're going to study in this uh, lesson. About 5,000 years ago, as people were settling into agricultural societies, the building of Stonehenge began. Over the next 1,250 years, this mysterious stone circle began and continued to evolve. These early builders dug through the turf to reveal this chalky white ground that was below. The largest stone at Stonehenge weighs over 35 tons. So just to be clear, that would be 70,000 pounds. And it was moved from a quarry 23 miles away. The circle also includes what we call blue stones, and they weigh several tons each. These came from a mountain range that is 150 miles away from the location of Stonehenge. How and why, we can only guess. One hint, though, does lie in this picture just above. At the summer solstice, if a person stands exactly in the middle of the circle at Stonehenge, the sun will rise directly over the distant stone visible between the closer stones. Now up above right is another artist's rendering of how Stonehenge may have been built, but really we can only guess. Uh, now we're going to look at a term, megalith. Stonehenge is one example of this phenomenon of megaliths, but it occurred all over Europe and Asia during the Neolithic period. These huge stones were placed in circles or patterns, often following the path of the sun, marking the solstice or the equinox, and very often marking grave sites. The term megalith means literally very big stone. Mega, large, lith, stone. You'll need to remember that. So what we have here are, um, this is called Viking graves, and it's off the coast of Brittany, right along the coast of Brittany, I should say. Um, the interesting thing about this one is that there are thousands of these, and we really don't know why that they were originally placed. On the right, we have the stone circle at Callendish, and this is a very famous stone circle in Scotland. Mm -hmm. On the bottom are two examples of which there are many more that are throughout Europe and the British Isles, and these are called uh, fairy thrones, and they're gigantic rock post and lintel structures that are placed for reasons that, again, we don't really know and can only guess. So how did the early people live? Well, throughout um, the world, they lived in a variety of ways. We're going to look at one of the common dwellings that was used in Europe. These consist, consisted of long timber buildings, and they housed several families each. One thing that's interesting to me about these is that they are very similar to the longhouses of the Native Americans on the northwest coast of the Americas. Now this example is from Ska Bray off, on the coast of Scotland. The village was buried under layers of sand in an ancient storm. Then, in 1850, it was unearthed in another storm, and this allowed a glimpse into a Neolithic village. Scabre had stone furniture, elaborate storage facilities, and built-in stone bed platforms. The stone shelf pictured here is a great example of what we will call post and lintel construction. That's something that you need to remember. Another example would be Stonehenge or a door frame in your house. Post and lintel creates a very strong support for construction and it's still used to this day. What is post and lintel? Well, it's very simple. Here's a post and here's a lintel. So two posts with something across the top. On the left here, we have an example of very early pottery. These would have been built in the coil method, and this one is from Czechoslovakia. Now let's look at a very famous early village, and that would be Ketelhoyek. This is an ancient village on the Konya Plain in Turkey. 
Konya is a very historic district in Turkey and this village was discovered mm, I think about 20 or 30 years ago so for thousands of years it was hidden beneath the earth. The village dates back to at least 78,000 BC and maybe we should call it a town because it was home to about 3,000 people. They lived in these houses clustered together. Much of their daily life took place on the rooftops where the animals lived and the entrances to the houses were built. They also had brick ovens and the pens for their animals. It's striking to see the sophistication of these early people and their artwork. They replastered their homes about once a year. Some homes had up to a hundred layers of plaster. They decorated their houses with artwork that seemed to have spiritual significance, as we see in this sculpture to the left. And they also buried the dead beneath their floors. Sometimes they would plaster uh, a dead person. They would encase them in plaster and keep them. Um, there's theories that maybe that was part of their ritual, that they would bring the people out, the deceased relatives out, for certain important times. And they encase them in this plaster in order to preserve them. One of the things that really strikes me about the dwellings at Ketelhoyuk is how close they are to the pueblos of the Native Americans of the southwest of this country. So now let's move over to the Americas and talk about uh, Cahokia, which sounds kind of like Ketelhoyuk, but it's in a different place in the world. Cahokia is where East St. Louis is today, so really just down the road. At its peak, Cahokia's population was around 10 to 20,000 people within the walls of the city, with uh, around 10,000 or more living no close by. Over 500 mounds were discovered in this area, plus skeletons that were configured in such a way that anthropologists speculate that the people of Cahokia may have practiced as human sacrifice, much as the ancestors or their the people did to the south in Mesoamerica and in South America. Now similar to Stonehenge the city had a henge or a circle that aligned with the sun at the summer solstice and this is probably something that they used to mark the year. The henge at Cahokia however was made of timbers of big pieces of wood rather than stone and Cahokia, although it peaked about 3,000 years ago, much later than the cultures of Europe that we've been looking at, there are many similarities between the two cultures. It was an active city in pre-Columbian America. Pre-Columbian simply means before the time of Columbus. Now let's look at one more of these mounds. This is the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. And this is really incredible when you think that these ancient people built it by probably using animal skins to um, move earth and primitive stone tools to cut into the earth. Now if you want to have a sense of scale, let's look right here. Okay, this is a staircase that goes up into the mound. So I find it really fascinating that they would be able to build this intricate of a structure even though one couldn't really stand back and get a view of it at that time. And for our last slide of this presentation, let's talk about the Hopewell people. They were one of the most advanced Mississippi cultures. They thrived from about 200 BC to 200 AD living in the Mississippi Valley, but they were great traders and they were fine artisans. This pipe to the left is created by a Hopewell artisan, but the eyes are pearl, which would have come from somewhere else. The map below shows um, a kind of a, an illustration of all the different places that these peoples traded with. We have mica that came from the Appalachian Mountains, copper from Michigan, turtle shells and shark's teeth from Florida, and much more. So the Hopewell people are an example of the great sophistication in the culture of the Americas. While there is so much more that we could look into with this lesson, this slide concludes the slide lecture for this module on prehistoric cultures across the world. 
So as I've said, we've only scratched the surface, but hopefully your curiosity has been aroused and you will continue to explore the subject. Thanks for listening.